Welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I'm Tim Moore, the Senior Evangelist for Lamb and Lion Ministries. And I'm Nathan Jones, Internet Evangelist here at Lamb and Lion. Whenever I lead a pilgrimage group to Israel, we always spend two nights in Tel Aviv, the economic heart of the country located right on the Mediterranean Sea. Most pilgrim groups do not spend time in Tel Aviv. We go there because it is where the modern state of Israel was born on May 14, 1948, when David Ben-Gurion read the Israeli Declaration of Independence. That momentous event just 75 years ago represents a miraculous fulfillment of Bible prophecy in our day and age. Our pilgrims are always struck by the apparent contradiction of Tel Aviv. It's founded on sand dunes just over 100 years ago, but is now a bustling modern city. And like New York City, it is said that Tel Aviv never sleeps. You can see proof of that on the beaches of the city. They stay lively all night long. Even more jarring to many Christian pilgrims is the rank secularism of Tel Aviv. Only an hour from Jerusalem, Greater Tel Aviv is the largest city in Israel. It is also overwhelmingly irreligious. Most Jews living there commemorate Yom Kippur and Hanukkah and other Jewish holidays, but without any real belief in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But as Elijah came to realize, even when paganism and disbelief is the ideology of the majority, God always preserves a remnant who are faithful to Him. Thankfully, He raised up one such man to be a light in the darkness of Tel Aviv. Our guest today is Avi Mizraki, an Israeli Jew, a Sabra, who became a follower of Yeshua, or Jesus Christ, during a visit to America. I'll let him tell you that story in a moment. But first, Avi, welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Thank you. We're so glad you're here. Well, Avi, I got to tell you, uh, I gave you our, our viewers a brief introduction to your testimony, but I tell us briefly how a cynical Jew from Israel came to be a follower of our Jewish Messiah. Yeah. Well, I was born and raised in Israel, and um, my parents uh, came to Israel in 1948 from Bulgaria. So I was raised in a Jewish home, finished high school, joined the army. I was um, four years in the Israeli Air Force, finished that, and uh, done my duty to my country. And then I uh, wanted to come to America to explore America. I was lost in sin. So I want to go to every discotheque in town, every nightclub. I had plans to go to Las Vegas and gamble, become rich. <laughs> so, uh, but God had another plan for my life. And uh, on my way to Las Vegas, I stopped to visit my sister in Florida. She used to live, she and her husband used to live in Florida. But you know, she's a born again believer and she invited me to go with her to church, to a Baptist church. And that's where I, I found the Lord. Wow. Well, how did you then feel called to go back to Israel, especially Tel Aviv, and start planning churches and other ministries, particularly called Dugit. And maybe you could tell us what Dugit means. Yeah, uh, ministry Dugit, he Hebrew Dugit means a small fishing boat. We are yeah. fishes of men, like you see in the cup here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, uh, when, uh, when I got saved, got married, I want to go to Bible school. So I came here to Dallas for two years of Bible study, uh, Bible college. And uh, when I finished that, I thought to stay in Texas, you know, I like to stay in Texas, drive these big American cars. Pick up. Get a pick up. <laughs> um, but uh, I prayed, I, I took a day of fasting, praying, seeking the Lord what He wants me to do. And the Lord spoke to me very clearly. He said, what are you doing here? Pick up your bags and go back home. And when the Lord said this, as a, you know, I was in the army, I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I said, yes. So we picked our bags, finished Bible school. My wife and I went back home to Tel Aviv because that's home. And I knew I want to do one thing, preach the gospel, make disciples. And that's how we started this coffee house, this evangelistic center. We will go out to the streets with a guitar, talking to people on the beach and share that there is hope in the Messiah. There is good news. Yeshua is risen from the dead. And that's how people start coming to the Lord. You know, when people go to Tel Aviv, they're struck because Tel Aviv is almost uh, a sense of New York City, San Francisco, and Las Vegas rolled into <laughs> one, a very secular place. And yet, when we come to Israel with our pilgrim groups, we love to come to Dugit and go to your prayer tower, which is located in a high rise overlooking the city and emphasizing that really we're not here just to look at dead stones, as you've said, but to pray for lost souls. And there are so many right there, yes. Jewish souls gathered in Tel Aviv. Yeah, that's right. Tel Aviv is very secular. It's also Tel Aviv Jaffa. And also it's the gate 
you know, the, airport, the international airport is there. And, and uh, many years before that, in the ancient Israel, of course, Jaffa was the port yeah. to come to, is to Israel. And many people, people go there and then they miss it. They run to Jerusalem, which is just another hour drive up the mountains. And, and, and that's fine. They want to see Jerusalem. But where most of the people live is really the Tel Aviv area, the whole center of Israel. More than 3 million Jews live right there. And, and that's where the harvest is. And, and that's where people are very open. And that's the reason I was, I was born and raised here. So for me, this is my hometown. But I believe that's where the harvest is. And that's where we're excited to reach out to our own Israelis with the good news. And you must have yeah. seen it change over time. I mean, just in the yeah. time that you know, Tim and I have been back and forth to see it grow exponentially like it is. I, I, one of our guides once joked that the uh, city's bird was the crane because you have so many cranes all over the place. That's and true. so when they started building the high rises and you, you got that tower and you pray over everybody, do you see as more and more people seem to, to make Aliyah and move into Tel Aviv and, and growing that there's a reception to Messianic Judaism? Well, I would say that uh, people are today much more open to the good news, to the gospel, than they were years before. And I believe it's because we have wonderful Christians praying for us. Mm. And, uh, and people also, you know, we live in a very stressful world. The uh, wars we have and, all, and the life is very expensive in Tel Aviv. You know, Tel Aviv has become... You know, you think about 110 years ago, there was nothing, just desert, <laughs> sand. And look at this city. And now it's become one of the most expensive city in the world to live in. Oh, yes. You can Google it, the most expensive city in Tel Aviv will show up. So it's a challenge, you know, to, it's very, the cost of living is very, very high. But yet, it's a lot of young people. It's the city of the young people and uh, the, 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 the business center, the stock exchange, the diamond center, the, the headquarters of the army, our Pentagon is in Tel Aviv. So uh, everything is in Tel Aviv, of course. Our government, our Knesset, the parliament is in Jerusalem, but everything else is in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and people are very open because they are searching, seeking, and we know that new age cannot satisfy them. Nothing can satisfy them, but only Yeshua. You know, when we go, I try to impress upon our pilgrims that whether in Israel, and, and obviously we're only there for a period of time, the, the odds that we're going to meet someone and develop a relationship is limited, but even as they come home, whether it's a Jew from Israel, whether it's a Jewish person living here in the United States, I tell them, seek a Jew. Pray for the Lord to allow you to cross paths with one Jew because you're one Jew who came to know the Lord and now is having tremendous impact in Tel Aviv. Uh, you've told us stories about other individual Jews, and that's the way God works. So we encourage our pilgrims to pray, not just for the peace of Jerusalem and for Israel in a generic general sense, but ask the Lord to, to impress upon your heart one person to focus your prayers on because obviously when Jesus came to Jerusalem, he said the, the city did not recognize the time of its visitation. Yeah. And we want to, to focus our prayers so that one Jew recognizes the Lord God in the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I, I believe in praying specific prayers, and I totally agree with you. And I believe the more we see believers praying for Israel, yes, and praying for the peace of Jerusalem, yes, but also praying that they will come to salvation, that the Prince of Peace will reign and rule in their hearts. Amen. You, know, you were on this program last year, and you gave an interesting statistic. You said there's about 7 million Jews of the 14 million or so in the world now living in Israel, but only 20,000 are Messianic Jews, according to your estimate. Do you still say that's the number? Yes. But so the it's way, a real small minority. Yeah, the, the way I look at it is, look what, what God has did, did. You know, I, I became a believer 39 years ago, almost 40 years ago. So I remember 40 years ago, 39 years ago, we were a few hundred believers. So what God has done in the last 30 years is tremendous. We've seen more and more Jews and Arabs coming to the Lord, but we are not satisfied. I want to see more and more Jews and Arabs coming to the Lord. Well, before we talk about some of the uh, aspect of the Jews and Arabs, because I want to explore that, I know of late uh, Israel has been under threat of attacks. As a matter of fact, it was attacked by the terrorists in Gaza, specifically the Islamic Brotherhood. And sometimes Israel does not sense that the United States, at least our current administration, is very supportive. So what is the perception of Israeli Jews as to the threat that exists nearby and far away and to their relationship with America? 
Yeah, well, first of all, in Israel, we know very well that our best allies is America. There's no question about it. Regardless who is leading it, America is our best friend. And uh, also, I believe now in the government, and also the, most of the Israelis, they know our best friends is the evangelicals. Mm. So uh, praise God that now we have come to a place where more and more uh, Israelis realizing there is wonderful Christians, evangelicals, who love Israel. And for example, uh, everybody still remembers Tr uh, President Trump because uh, you know he promised to move the, the embassy to Jerusalem, and he did. I mean, he's the only pro president that promised and did it. So. Uh, Definitely, uh, Israelis, we love Americans, and we love America, and we thank God for the standing with us in such a time. Yeah. Jan Markell at one of our conferences a few years ago gave this fantastic presentation where she showed the support of each administration uh, since the 1950s, and it was really eye-opening to me that it didn't matter if it was Republican or Democrat. Actually, some of the Democratic presidents were more pro-Israel than the Republican which is interesting. But one of the, the things that we get in, in the ministry all the time when they want to go on an Israel tour with, with Tim is, is it a dangerous place to live? I mean, there's missiles flying all over. Tim, you were just over there while Operation what was it, Shield and Arrow was yeah. going on. What do you tell people that want them to visit Israel or even make Aliyah to Israel about the safety of living in Israel? Yes, I feel very safe in Israel. In fact, many times here, I don't feel safe in America. Yeah. <laughs> For good reason, I would say. I'll give you just a simple example. Years ago, I went to visit my friend as a pastor in Chicago. Yeah, I spoke there Sunday night, and I like ice cream. So after the service, I passed, let's go downtown and have a nice, nice ice cream. And he goes, oh, no. And I said, why not? He said, oh, it's too dangerous. We cannot go downtown Chicago for an ice cream midnight. Uh, well, that <laughs> night, late at night. And I was like, why not? We can do it in Tel Aviv, it's very safe. And this is how I feel as an Israeli. <laughs> you have more shooting in America than in Israel, so what's the problem? <laughs> That's um, good. But Sad, again, good point. Yeah. But again, you know, we, um, we have terrorists. Like, we cannot say that we don't have terrorists, but, but we take care of them. Yes, you do. As a matter of fact, in this most recent, uh, you know, attack, a series of attacks by Islamic Brotherhood, obviously Israel responded. The sad thing to me is that the United States, United Nations, other nations always ask Israel to exercise restraint or to stop attacking the, the poor people in Gaza, even though it is those terrorists in Gaza that are targeting Israel. And Israel's very careful yeah. to isolate its targets instead of shooting indiscriminately like the terrorists do. Israel only goes after the actual perpetrators of violence and, and wickedness. That's true. That's true. In fact, I like to share this. Uh, like we have a dear friend, uh, Pastor uh, Michael Biner. He's a uh, leader of a messianic congregation in the city of Shderot, which is about a mile, two miles from Gaza Strip. And you know, from the 9th to the 13th of May, just a month ago, we had them shooting all the terrorists from yeah. Gaza into Israel, about 1,500, 1,500 rockets in four or five days. Can you imagine 400 yard rockets every day? And, 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 um, and the reason I share this because Michael, my friend Michael, he lives in Israel, and they said when, when they hear, and they know the sound goes off, they have 20 seconds to run to the bomb shelter. And can you imagine living this every day for four, five days? And I asked him, how do you handle this? He said, well, I take my wife and my family. When we're at home, we just stay in the bomb shelter. Mm. Mm. Because there's not enough run, time to run to the bomb shelter. We stay right. in the bomb shelter. If we go out, we just pray that we can do the grocery shopping and come home. And we live. He basically slept with his, with his children in the yeah, bomb, bomb shelter, shelter because he said it's, it's the whole night, boom, boom, boom. I went, like, how can you live this with this? But this is because they shoot at, at innocent civilians. And then our efforts, when they find out who shot it, they go st specifically and, 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 and bomb the, the terrorists and the launchers. Yes. But we don't go after the people. No, of course not. And the other thing that a lot of folks don't realize, even our pilgrims didn't realize, Israel has allowed Gazans to come back into Israel on work visas. So this claim that Israel has, uh, has occupied Gaza, you, the United Nations still considers Gaza to be occupied. It is not. It's not. Israel actually provides their food, their medicine, their Elec fuel. Electricity. Yeah, and even when fuel is a very limited supply, it's amazing how the government officials and the terrorists always have plenty of gas, plenty of, uh, of well, uh, material, but the poor people there oftentimes are, are not yeah. provided for, and yet Israel does try to provide even jobs 
why in the world this, this satanic hatred inspires some to resort to terrorism is beyond our comprehension, but that's exactly it. It is satanic. That's true. That's very true. I remember in 2005 when George W. Bush pushed this two-state solution and pulled the Jewish people out of the Gaza Strip, and immediately the Gazans leveled all the economy there and made it a, a basically a military zone to attack Israel. But the only power plant that was powering all of Gaza was on Israel's side. And when Israel said, it's time for you to pay your bill, you know, they threw a fit and they said, oh, these evil Israelis are trying to charge us for electricity. So Israel's been providing electricity since 2005 free to the Gazan people and the world don't know that. Uh, Israel always seems to get the bad right. The, the Arabs are masters of PR. What is it like to, to live in Israel and always know that satanically, as Tim says, the world hates you and for no really good reasons? Well, it definitely puts a lot of stress. The, the, when you live in Israel, I mean, it's nice when, you, you know, people come as tourists and stay in a hotel and tour around. It's beautiful. But those who live there every day, the, the stress level is, is, is a lot. And, and we are, and of course, uh, our soldiers are doing a great job watching our borders uh, so that uh, we don't have any terrorists trying to infiltrate, like it just happened just a couple of days ago when a, Egypt. a, a mm -hmm. Egyptian, yeah, Egyptian, it was a policeman. He came in and with a gun and we thought this, he started shooting and killed three Israeli soldiers for no, for no reason. He yeah, was a beautiful terrorist. young lady too. Yeah, so it's like it shows you that, um, yeah, it's a challenge. Uh, um, but, you know, we trust in the Lord. He that keepeth Israel shall not slumber nor sleep. And I can tell you, the angels in Israel are working very hard for 24-7. Well, the angels are working very hard, obviously. <laughs> you, a lot of people think about the Israeli Defense Force, about your tremendous uh, intelligence agencies keeping an eye on Iran and other threats around the world. Yeah. But the Bible says someday every nation will come against Israel, come against Jerusalem specifically, and the Jewish people. And it says a coalition from Gog, a land way up to the north, we That's think, right. is Russia will come against Israel. And yet, even the United States will fail. The IDF will not be uh, sufficient. And so the Lord will supernaturally Amen. protect Israel. Amen. And only following that, when the vast majority of the Jews, well, when the Jews themselves cry out, Baruch Abab, Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, will Jesus return. So... There's worse days coming, yeah. but we know that God in His uh, glorious plan yeah. will protect and preserve a great remnant of the Jewish people. And it's amazing because you see what has happened in the last few years, that, that those countries who become allies like Russia, Iran, Syria. Yes. I mean, it's all there ready to come from the north. The Gog Magog coalition is, is forming. Interesting. Well, we've said, and to quote Jan Markell again, the world is not just falling to pieces, the pieces are falling in place, proving that uh, the signs of the times are converging and the rapture of the church is imminent, and then the return of Jesus is also uh, soon to follow, and the church being Jew and Gentile alike. But I want to explore one other aspect that you've already touched on, and that is the healing power of the gospel to a Jewish heart, to a Gentile heart, to an Arab heart. So tell us about some of the interaction you have with uh, Arab pastors and Christians there in Israel and even here in America. Yeah, definitely. God is working. God is working and the kingdom of God is expanding in Israel and, uh, and especially also among the Jewish and the Arabs. So as you shared earlier, we have more than 9 million people living in Israel today. It's more than 7 million Jews and a million and a half Arabs, Arab Israelis. And we see uh, 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 congregations coming, growing up you know, among the Jewish people and the Arab people. Mm. And we've had many meetings where Jews and Arabs will come together Praise and pray together. Wow. For example, uh, we had a, a classic meeting uh, in, in Nazareth about 10 years ago. And I'd like to share a little bit about that. Please. They, there was a, they rented a big hall, the Arab believers in Nazareth. You know, it's mostly Arab in Nazareth, in the Galilee. And they had a time of worship and they invited us to come. And after, after uh, they had time of worship, and they said, we want to take time to pray for one another. But before that, one of the Arab leaders said, I'm a pastor, so, but I want to identify and I want to repent for the Arab world who want to kill you as oh, Jewish my. people. So we, the Jewish people, came onto the stage and we said, we forgive you, we love you, we are your brothers. And then I said, I came as a Jew, I said, yes, and as a Jew, many times, maybe we the Israelis have treated you as a second class. And please forgive us. And he stood there and he forgave us. So it's like we identified of the sin of our peoples. 
And, and here as believers, we were able to forgive one another, pray for one another, and then we fell from the Lord to wash each other's feet. Mm -hmm. And then we took communion together. In the end of this two, three hours meeting, after we have done this, I mean, the presence of God was so strong and beautiful. And then we decided the both teams, uh, the Jewish and Arab, got together and started worshiping. And we started holding hands and we started dancing in the hall together, <laughs> worshiping the King of Kings wow. and the Lord, Praise proclaiming the Lord. there is only one Lord. And this is what God is doing with the local body in Israel, Jewish and Arab, coming together as the one new man, welcoming the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. In preparation for that, I, I, some people get confused. They think, well, okay, the Messianic Jewish people, they somehow disconnect them from being part of the church. But when the rapture happens, you're going up to heaven. You're, there's going to be no Messianic Jews left in Israel, at least for the first few minutes, I think probably quite a lot <laughs> after that. What is Dugit doing to help prepare the Jewish people to bring about the 144,000 Jewish evangelists and the Jews to come to Christ as their Savior. Well, we know that mm -hmm. one third of the Jewish people by the end of the tribulation will be saved. I know we here at Lamb and Lion Ministries believe our biggest ministry will probably be after the rapture with all the materials we leave behind. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one, one way of looking at things. <laughs> so if, if I may say, if the rapture happens, I'm ready. But if the rapture does not happen, I'm still ready. Yeah. So that's one of the things that I put in front of me. I want to see all the 9 million Israelis who live in the land of Israel coming to salvation. Amen. And, and I believe that's, I believe that as the scripture says in Romans, all of Israel, my heart's desire and prayer that all Israel will be saved. And that's my goal. And that's what I want to see happening. And it's a challenge. And, but I tell you, it's a powerful testimony for a secular Jew or even a religious Jew that when they see a Jew and an Arab where they used to hate each other, but now they love one another and they support one another and pray together. That's, that's a very powerful testimony. Sure. This is what God is doing in Israel. And we want to thank you guys, you know, in America and all the wonderful evangelical Christians praying for us for such a time as this. Well, we have many friends who have powerful testimonies, and we've seen God transform lives, Jew, Arab, Gentile. It, it, he is no respecter of, of background or ethnicity, but he wants all to come to faith. And so we know the rapture is going to happen, but as you said, until it does, we have to be about his business. Our friend uh, Olivier Melnick makes a point. He said, the Lord didn't say how many Jews would be left. He just says that there's a percentage who would perish and a percentage who would become believers. So we want the number to dwindle because more and more join the church Amen. and are raptured out of the world. But you talked about some of the, the pushback even that you would get as a Messianic Jew, uh, how difficult it is to make Aliyah to Israel if you identify as a follower of Yeshua. And even from your own heritage, your, your family from Bulgaria, uh, you have a powerful testimony about how a Messianic believer, follower of Christ, partnering with a Gentile follower of Christ, helped save people, Jewish people, in Bulgaria. Yeah, that's very true. You see, I, I was born in Israel, but my parents came to Israel from Bulgaria. And they went, especially my father, he was from Sofia, Bulgaria. He went through the, to, during the Second World War and all the persecution and the Holocaust. And uh, it's amazing because at that, during the Second World War II, Bulgaria was an, like an ally to Germany and to Hitler, and they agreed to give the, all the 50,000 Jews from Bulgaria to the Nazis to be killed and be slaughtered in Auschwitz oh. and Treblinka. So what's amazing in all this, there's a beautiful story of this uh, bishop of the Orthodox Church by the name of Stefan, who was a believer and a lover of Israel, and there was this uh, Orthodox rabbi, Daniel Sion, who had a vision of Jesus and became a believer. And then they decided together to work together mm. to influence the King Boris, the King of Bulgaria, and the parliament not to give the Jews to the Nazis into the trains to go to Auschwitz. And it's a known fact that in 1943, during the Second World War, when Hitler sent three times, he sent the trains to Sofia to collect the Jews. Three times those trains went back home f empty with no Jews. Mm. And all the Jews in Bulgaria were saved from going to the, Lord. the Holocaust. You know, I think that's a beautiful testimony, Avi, because we think Eastern Orthodox, they may not be evangelical, but this man loved the Lord. He loved the Jewish people. 
And then you think of the Orthodox Jew, Daniel Sion, yep. whose name means Zion, yep. and he became a follower of Yeshua. And together, because of their shared faith yep. in Yeshua, our Jewish Messiah, yep. they were able to intercede for 50,000 Jews living in Bulgaria, including your own parents. Yes, otherwise I would not be here today. Well, the Lord had a plan. And, and the fact that he raises up individuals. So folks, I say again, if you don't already know a specific Jew, pray that the Lord will send one your way. Somebody like Avi, if you do know a specific Jew or several, start naming them by name in your prayers that the Lord would intercede in their lives and perhaps give you the opportunity to share your faith in your Jewish Messiah. Because whether it is Avi, whether it is his growing family in Tel Aviv, or someone living close to you, the Lord wants all to come to believing faith Amen. in Yeshua, Amen. Jesus Christ, our Jewish Messiah. Amen. Avi, any other words for our viewers today? How can they get in touch with you and all the wonderful things happening at Dugit? Well, they can go to our website, www.dugit.org. There is information there. And pray for us. Definitely, we need your prayers. Without prayers, nothing happens. And so we just want to thank you for your prayers and for your support. Well, I want to thank you for your friendship. I am so blessed, Nathan and I, all of us at Lamb and Lion Ministries, by our relationship with Dugit and uh, with you personally. And so may the Lord continue to touch many lives in Tel Aviv and around the world through your ministry, Avi. Thank you. Godspeed. Thank you. I hope you will join us next week. But until then, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the salvation of a specific Jew. And pray that you will see the Lord coming soon and very soon. Godspeed. For over 42 years, Lamb and Lion Ministries has proclaimed the soon return of Jesus Christ to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. Our entire staff is dedicated to that gospel-centered message, which we get out through the Christ in Prophecy television program, our bi-monthly magazine, The Lamplighter, a huge library of books, pamphlets, DVDs, and of course, our dynamic and interactive website. We point new generations and new audiences to our blessed hope. And I hope that you've found it to be encouraging to you because we can't do it alone. This faith-based ministry is supported by thousands of Prophecy Partners, which enable our outreach through their faithful prayer and financial support. Prophecy Partners commit to contributing $25 a month, less than a dollar a day. And in return, they receive a print edition of our Lamplighter magazine and updates on the impact this ministry is having around the world. If you've been blessed by Lamb and Lion Ministries, join with us, partner to share the exciting message that Jesus is coming soon. Godspeed.